I have a saying, you can eat the whole grape or you can take a bite of the watermelon. I, I choose the watermelon every time. So in, in, we gave up a significant part of our company to get five or three other folks on, but they're really, really high powered folks. I, I could hire 42 assistants and they would not do even a fraction of the work that these three folks do. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hey, real quick before we get started, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us on the show and for listening uh, to all my loyal listeners. I really appreciate you, uh, you know, continuing to listen and support the show. If you can go on to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you listen and subscribe to the show, that would be fantastic. Spread the word too. I'd love to, you know, have this reach more and more people. So if you could share it on social media or, or, or and just talk about it to other people, that would be fantastic. And the last thing is if you can go on to iTunes and give us a rating review, uh, hopefully five stars, that would be great as well. It just helps us spread the word more and it helps us get continue to get uh, really good guests on the show. We've had some fantastic guests and I just want to be able to continue to bring fantastic value to you. Go on to our Facebook page too, Pillars of Wealth Facebook page. And I'd like to hear from, from you as a listener of you know, what you're doing in business, what you've got going on, what you are maybe struggling with or uh, being successful with, and then what we can do on the show to help push you to that next level. Maybe uh, questions we can ask our guests, maybe guests that we can get on the show to talk about certain topics, certain things that are really neat, you're needing uh, some, some extra support with. So provide for us some feedback on Facebook, um, and you can also share this out on, on social media. That would be fantastic as well. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being a uh, being a either new listener or a loyal listener. I definitely appreciate it. And we will get started with the show. And hey, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Daxhammer. With me today is Scott Lewis. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Todd. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I appreciate you joining the show. A little bit about Scott. Uh, Scott's the founder and CEO of Spartan Investment Group, LLC, so SIG, and has led several successful real estate projects ranging from single family flips to raw land development. To date, SIG has completed $6 million in development projects and has $30 million more underway and raised over $10 million in private equity. As CEO, Scott's responsible for developing business strategies and plans, ensuring their alignment with short-term and long-term objectives. Um, Scott is also a major in the Army Reserves and is an Operation Iraqi Freedom Veteran. So with that, Scott, give our listeners a little bit more about your background and uh and kind of what you guys are doing today yeah thanks todd so uh, I, I think you summed it up pretty good on me I, I was a corporate guy and got tired of that and joined active duty and went and played in the sandbox for a little bit and then kind of came out and uh became a government guy and that that didn't really fit me all that well so um really kind of looked for an opportunity to to build a company in which you know uh, my efforts could provide, you know, a work environment that enriches people both personally and professionally. And that was really kind of my drive for, for co-founding Spartan Investment Group with my partner, Ryan Gibson. So that's, that's really kind of what, what brought me to, to Spartan. And, and Spartan itself is uh, an investment group that develops and syndicates real estate deals and we're primarily focused on self storage uh, right now, but we do own an RV park. Uh, we are engaged in, in negotiations to build a mobile home park. Uh, so for your listeners, that seems a little bit confusing, but um, as, I'll, as I'll hopefully have a chance to get into, we, we, we've come to those conclusions by establishing three evaluation criteria for real estate assets that are really important to us. And 
there, there's several assets that fall within those evaluation criteria that we're willing to do. So that's kind of where that, that's, that would, that's what drives our overall strategy. Well, let's, since you mentioned it, let's talk about these uh, three evaluation criteria that you guys look at. Awesome. So I'll, I'll start with the genesis of where they came from. So we started out as residential house flippers and quickly realized that we really didn't have an appetite for it. We weren't all that good at it uh, either, just because we just, it's just not our focus dealing with, with a retail type residential transactions. It's not really what we wanted to do. So we, in October of 2016, we as a company went through kind of a strategic decision-making process that's modeled on the military decision-making process that, that I bring into the organization as a, as a veteran and as a current Army reservist. And one of our other folks also worked in the military environment, so she understands the planning process and we've taught it to our group. And basically what that, that planning process does is it, it enables you to evaluate a number of different courses of action in a pretty complex environment when you don't have all the information. And that's kind of where we were at in 2016 is we knew we wanted to move into commercial asset classes, but we didn't really have a lot of experience with it. So what we did is we, we first developed three evaluation criteria, which were really important to us when we started looking at all these different uh, asset classes. And those evaluation criteria were ease of management, very easy to operate, and quick rent recapture or eviction processes. So that, that kind of gave us the initial groundwork with, that when we were looking at these different asset classes, it enabled us to uh, and, like, compare them side by side with these evaluation criteria. And then storage kind of fell to the bottom of the heap as the one that, that stood out to us the most. Yeah, I mean, uh, the as far as I know, self storage is is very low management. Um, it, it, as I'm reading about it, there's a lot of automation that's, you know, either going on or already happened. Where uh, it sounds like there's even, uh, and I, you can expand upon this, but it sounds like there's a lot of self storages that don't even have really an office anymore. It's all basically automated. Um, and then the eviction process, as far as I understand, is, is very quick and easy. Uh, is that, uh, exp I guess, expand upon that so our listeners can understand. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the, the automation side first. And that, that is true. There's a ton of automation coming to the, to the, mar to the marketplace and to the industry as a whole. And, and Red Dot is a large company that, their business model is 100% uh, automated. They, they use kiosks that can basically do everything that a human can except for sell. So there's an argument, there's kind of a, uh, I'll say this, this back and forth between the traditionalists and the, the new ageists, I'll call them. And the argument is whether the kiosk can, man, can, can operate a facility as well as a manager can. And to, to some cases it can, but there's a lot of cases that it can't. So most of the facilities that you see that are totally automated are smaller facilities, uh, sub 40,000 square feet or so. They don't have a lot of additional revenue streams like U-Haul or box sales or FedEx boxes or, or, or any of this other packing materials, any of these other revenue streams, because it, it just couldn't do that. So it really depends on your business plan of whether the fully automated facility will do as good as, as uh, financially as you were hoping to do. So th there is that. Then as far as the eviction process go, it, like, like multifamily and a lot of the other asset classes, it's state by state. But generally, states don't really care about someone's stuff. They're not really worried about protecting grandma's old tea kettle. So the, the eviction process is, you know, in the fast states, it's 60 days. In the, in the slow states, it might be 120 days. And basically what that looks like is when somebody doesn't pay you, you, you go through the, the notification processes per the state guidelines. And when they don't pay, you put your stuff up for auction. Now, some people may have seen storage wars, and I will tell the listeners that there's never a midget on some guy's shoulders, like trying to get pictures of the unit. That doesn't happen. <laughs> um, maybe it does there's there's probably some operators that have pretty interesting auctions we do all of ours online we don't actually hold the auctions at the facility so basically what that looks like is we take a bunch of pictures of the units put it online and then you know folks that 
that do this, they go on and they bid and they, they pay whatever it is. The one thing I will kind of tell the listeners, because people are like, you know, may see storage wars and somebody bids this unit, they get $10,000. Well, it's not quite that way. The storage operator basically gets paid back for all their fees, their fines, all the work that they've done to do this. And then they, they can't just keep the extra money. It's got to go back to that storage owner if there's any uh, stuff that's left over. Hmm, interesting. Okay. So a little bit de- different than, than TV. I've never watched Storage Wars, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I've heard of it. I just don't really know what it's too much about. So. There's a lot of other shows on Netflix that are far more riveting. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, well, cool. So, so you got into the self-storage uh, for, for kind of these, the three evaluation criteria. What attracted you to then the RV park and the mobile home? Does, does it kind of do they, they meet the criteria? The same, the same criteria. So they are pretty close. Mobile home park really doesn't. So we probably wouldn't, if this, if the deal goes forward, we probably wouldn't operate it. We would sell it off. Um, you know, we might, we might sell out the units and then sell it off. That's not really our, it's just a really good opportunity for us. Um, so that, that's why we're looking at that particular deal, but the RV park does. So with an RV park, again, it's, it's not really housing that you're messing with. So the, the, it's easy to operate. It's easy to maintain. There's, there's not much. There's a little bit more maintenance for an RV park than there is for storage, but not like a multifamily or an office building. Even if you're under triple net, you've still got your, your common areas that need to be maintained and that kind of stuff. So not still nowhere near the other asset classes and the, you know, folks don't pay then most jurisdictions, there's an eviction process. And in the one in Texas that we own, the eviction process takes about three months, which is not bad. But most people won't even go that way because, you know, once it, once it starts to go sideways and you start that eviction proceeding, most people just hook up their RP and drive away. Now, the, now recapturing rent, that, that's just on the operator on, on, how, on how hard you want to push if you want to send them to collections and whatnot. I'll be honest with our RV park in Texas. We have very, very little of that because most, most, most people, it's an RV park, right? It's not, they, they don't get down on their luck and then, and then stay in an RV park and, and take money from you. Um, generally not that way. So the, the RV park and RV parks in general very much do kind of meet our uh, evaluation criteria. So with the RV park, are, are these people actually like living there? 12 months out of the year or do they just, they just use it. Uh, they come and visit on the weekends type of thing. That's more of their camping or how, what do you got to mix? So for our, our RV park, it is in uh, Odessa, Texas, and that's in the Permian basin in Texas, which if your listeners that are not familiar with the Permian, that is oil country USA. It's an absolutely amazing site to see when you fly in and, and, some of the more environmental listeners may disagree with me on this one, but <laughs> just to fly in and, and see like oil pump jacks as far as the eye can see. Um, now it's, it's desert. So it's, it's, they're not exactly, you know, punctuating this beautiful mountainous uh, <laughs> terrain, but it's just, it, it's absolutely uh, crazy to, to see. So for that one, that one is mainly supporting oil field workers. So there's folks, very few are there for, for nightly or weekly. Uh, very few are also there for, for yearly. It's generally between three to nine month stays when they come down there. Some are there long term. Uh, we have some folks that have been there three or four years that have stable jobs down there that just decide to live in their RVs. But most are, are contract workers that are coming through for a fixed amount of time and whether they're highly skilled uh, very specialized laborers that are brought in for a particular contract for say three weeks to nine weeks, something like that, or they're just general laborers that are there for a six month contract to you know, build a pump jack and then move on. Um, it's generally not not like your your traditional RV park that most people think about, where it's like a KOA and it's really nice and people come there and they stay there for a couple of nights and they move on. It, that that's not our RV park. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, just def- definitely interesting when you talk to different people. One of the cool things about having a podcast is I get to talk to a lot of different people that do all kinds of niches in real estate. And there's just so many 
different opportunities. I mean, you're talking about self storage, you guys have an RV park, and you're doing a mobile home park development, which when I talk to most people about mobile homes, they say, the reason why mobile homes are attractive is because nobody's developing and building them. But yet you guys are looking at actually developing and building a mobile home park. Is that correct? Am I, did, did I misunderstand you when you said that? No, it, it, no, you, you were correct. It's in the very, very early stages. We don't even have it under LOI yet. The reason I'm talking about it is it, it, it's something when, when we look at our different, um, our, the different projects that Spartan um, has the opportunity to do because we have a development core competency and we've, we, we've expanded our RV park, um, ex building an RV park and building a mobile home park. There, there isn't a huge difference between the two uh, when you go out there and you're, and you're looking at uh, developing those. So the, the, there's a good chance that the, the mobile home park deal will fall apart, um, you know, probably 50-50, because like I said, we're just faking it out. But, you know, we should know, you know this week of whether it's going to go or not. And if it does, then yes, we will, in fact, be building a mobile home park, which for the mobile home park guys out there know that very, very few get built. Um, so they're, they're very, very interesting that we're getting the op We may have the opportunity to build one. Uh, you don't have to answer this if it uh, gets a little too, you know, close to, because you, since you don't have it under contract or haven't closed, um, is this in a, is this a vacation area? Is it a oil field type area? You know, where, where's jobs? Uh, what, what's the attraction to this area? Yeah, so I, I hate to do this to you, Todd, but I'm gonna yeah, like fine. I'm gonna hold everything to my chest really <laughs> close. When we when we get it under contract and we're ready to go, then I will circle back and I will I will sing about this deal till <laughs> to your heart's content. But right now, I, um, I've said probably too much, and when and yeah. and when folks are can hear me talking about that, I'm gonna get yelled at for sure. There's, there's not a doubt in my mind. The good the good thing about it is. Uh, we record a ways out. So this deal will either already be moving or it'll be dead. So that's the I'm good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Scott, I, I, I'm interested in the, in the talking a little bit about the development because you guys, not only do you buy existing product um, and prior to us really recording, you talked about you buy existing product with, the opportunity for expansion, but you also do development. What attracts you to development over an existing product that's already in place? So, so great question. And I don't, I, I don't know if there's an attraction to a development over an existing product or in addition to, and really kind of the reason that we do it, is we are very, very process and system uh, systems oriented. So if you're if you're going to go into development and you are not the type of person that can that is disciplined enough to adhere to a process or develop systems, then it's going to be a disaster for you to do that. Me being an army guy, my business partner being a commercial airline pilot, we are very, very checklist processes systems very disciplined in that regard. So development kind of came pretty natural to us. And we do it because there's not a lot of people that do do it. it it's funny on, you know, I'm on uh, a number of different podcasts and, you know, whenever the word development comes up, you know, the host is almost always drawn to it. They're like, whoa, let's talk about development. And it's because there's not a ton of people that, you know, will do that. Now, whether that is because we're just super awesome or we're just dumber than everybody else, it's probably the latter. And that's why we do it. But, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. We enjoy the challenge of working through with cities and various stakeholders. Uh, Ryan Gibson, my business partner, is just absolutely amazing at uh, developing relationships and rapport with neighbors. It's one of the first things that we do is engage the local neighbors as soon as the project starts to come out on uh, kind of develop because neighbors can can shut your project down and, and getting them on your team early on is, a, is can be a huge, huge win and, and really like save you from a lot of time suck for, for neighbors that are not brought into the decision process on what you're doing. Because a, a lot of the time, 
on the development side, you know, really simple things can can help a neighbor be on your team versus versus not be on your team. But that's really kind of where you know we we go with development. It just opens up another avenue of approach for us to do a deal where there's a lot of other people that don't. I, Basically, anybody can buy an existing facility and, and you know probably run it as well as it's being run. Maybe that's maybe that's not the case, but it's far easier to buy an existing facility than it is to build something from scratch. Yeah, I th- and I think that's where lies the attraction, right? Is because uh, there there's definitely more risk up front when you're doing a develop- development. I mean, you've got you've got money that you're putting, capital that you're outlaying. Uh, and a good chunk of capital that you're outlaying. And then you start the development, there's even more capital that you're outlaying and there's zero profit until it's done. Um, or at least done, or at least a phase of it's done. Um, so there's definitely that risk involved. Yet when it's finished and it's done, it's, it's the cream of the crop, right? It's the best facility in the area. It's brand new. It's a it's very attractive. So I think that's what gets people intrigued about it. It's a very intriguing process. And as you said, pretty much anybody can buy an existing asset and run it at least close to how it was being run in the, in, in the past. Um, development is a big process. I, it is. And you know, we we have a development of a sort self storage and in, in up in upper uh, upper northwest of the country, and it won't cash flow for five years. So you know, we you have to have the the runway to make sure that you can that you can cover yourself with operating capital to get to that. And you also have to find investors that are okay with investing their money for the long haul. So that's that's a ten year investment. So kind of, you know, one of the things we've seen right now with a lot of investor sentiment out there is it's fo- folks are looking for a uh, pretty good yield in a very short amount of time, you know, two to three years. And that's not a development play. Now, a development play generally, you know, has returns 8% higher or so than, than a value add, you know, 10 to 10 to 15% higher than a core, core plus play. But you got to be willing to wait for it. So development is not for the faint of heart. Um, whether you're the developer or the investor, the investor has to be okay with delays, has to be okay with broken timelines, because a lot of times we are not in control of it. On this particular project, we've been waiting on the Army Corps of Engineers for eight months now. Their website says they'll return a decision within 60 days. Uh, so we're at 240 days right now, and that's not because of us. So you know, there's nothing we can do about that. So you, as the investor, you've got to just be willing to ride that roller coaster. But, um, you know, at, at some point, it'll be a very, very fast and, and, and exciting roller coaster to be on. So when you're, you know, you've got this uh, project that you're talking about in the Northwest, and, and uh, it sounds like you've already raised money for that. Uh, take, me, take me through a raise and maybe if you can. Uh, are are you okay with taking me through a raise? Yeah, no problem. Okay. So take me through a raise. First of all, take me through a couple of the, uh, investor maybe objections and you've already kind of hit on them. Um, but then are you collecting the money kind of up front? Are you going as the project, you know, cycles? Uh, how, how are you doing that? Yeah, so I, I can speak to that one, and I'm going to stay away from talking about returns or whatever because we do 506B offerings, so yeah. I can't talk about returns in, in general. But you know, for that particular project, we raised most of the money up front. Now, as the project progresses and it gets more and more detailed, the the costs are changing. We're having some some challenges with construction costs, as everybody out there that's building is. So it may be one of those things where we have to reopen the offering to raise a little bit more equity because of the construction cost. But generally in that one, we raised all the equity up front. Uh, we, we bought the land that was conditioned on getting a conditional use permit. So we, we, were, we had, were successful in securing a conditional use permit. And we, um, we then went and we're we're going through the planning process and it's taken a lot longer than was supposed to because of um 
the city has taken a little bit longer on their timelines. The Army Corps has has quadrupled theirs, and it's just it it it's one of those things that it just it the development side of the house is kind of the wild west until you get your building permit. When you get your building permit, then then generally your timeline settles down a little bit. And that was one of the key investor objections was the timeline, right? So so some of the investors were like, well, I need a more you know secure timeline because we're very upfront with folks by saying like, listen guys, this is a projection. We can't control government agencies and they're they're not in a hurry to help you get your project through. Some are if they want the development. Self storage usually isn't one of those. Um, we have we we do have support from the mayor and the city of Black Diamond. It's it's the Army Corps of Engineers that is stalling the project on on that particular one. So, you know, so sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't. But that was one of the key uh, objections. And the other one's just development. A lot of people are scared of it, which and rightfully so. I mean, people could lose all their money. Um, you know, we we have various gates that we go through in our due diligence process to try to mitigate the development risks as much as we as much as we can, but. We call it the dinosaur bone risk. That is a that is a risk that there's there's very little that we can do to to mitigate that risk, and it stays all the way until the entire site is desert, disturbed. And basically, the dinosaur bone risk, just like it sounds, you start moving dirt, you find dinosaur bone. Well, game over. Um, so that that risk stays until you've moved the site. Now you can. You can go out there and dig around a little bit. Most jurisdictions won't let you go tear up the site um, before you buy it. So that, that risk is always there and it's very, very, very hard to mitigate. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Hey, I'm super excited to announce the North Star Real Estate Conference that uh, I am putting together along with a few other friends. And we are expecting to have a great crowd there. This is going to be September 20th and 21st in Minneapolis in the Twin Cities area and hey it'll still be warm and we're going to have a ton of great speakers there we're going to have uh, some motivational speakers we're expecting to have uh, speakers talking about a lot of different commercial real estate topics multifamily and commercial real estate so we want you there we would love to have uh, a great crowd there we'd love to have you there and the cool thing with this conference is all the profits are going to uh, benefit charity they're going to benefit junior achievement specifically who they uh, serve underserved uh, youth and they, they bring financial education to them they not only teach financial education, but they teach the, the kids how to be entrepreneurs, how to be business leaders, and how to really do fantastic things after they're out of school and, and moving on. So that's who we're uh, gonna be benefiting. We're gonna also have a charity gala. It's gonna be a fun event, and I'd love to have you attend. So again, it's called the North Star Real Estate Conference. Check it out. We've got uh, links that we'll put on the show notes. Uh, we would love to have you there. We'd love to have you attend. Speaker lineup is coming and uh, that'll be announced uh, shortly. We do have a few speakers already uh, lined up, so you'll be able to see that. We've got Trevor McGregor will be our keynote speaker. He's a master platinum coach. So you're gonna love this event. We are gonna just have a ton of fun and learn a bunch and also benefit a great organization as well. I will see you there. Check out our show notes for the links. Let's let's transition a little bit because you are, you know, the the you, you deal with developing business strategies and you know plans to ensure that your that your business is being run, you know, properly. And that's really what I love to talk about too on on this podcast is I, you know, there's a lot of people in real estate that are just transactional. They focus on you know, buying that property. Um, and that's kind of where they're focused. They're not focused on building their business. So talk to us a little bit about maybe uh, give us oh, two or three kind of key strategies that you guys or you focus on uh, in ensuring that your business is, is operating smoothly and, and successfully. Yeah, so the, you know, the first thing I would say is, you know, there's a quote from Lewis Carroll and it's Alice talking to the cat and Alice is like, well, which road do I take? And the cat's like, well, where do you want to go? And 
Alice is like, well, I don't know. And he's like, well, then you, any road will get you there, right? <laughs> the, you know, one of the key things that we did right out of the gate is we, you know, we established that end state kind of right away. Now it's changed, but it's been a pivot, not, you know, not a 180. Our original end state, as I said, we were in residential when we originally kind of did our strategic planning. And that, that was an endpoint to, to generate, you know, $100 million portfolio. Um, and it, and it, it included some commercial stuff, and, but, but mainly it was residential commercial, like, I'm sorry, residential uh, condo conversions and that kind of stuff. Well, we, we quickly decided we didn't like to do that, but we pivoted. But it, it didn't change a ton of our strategic plan. It, it changed the end state, but a lot of the, the supporting tasks within there stayed very much the same. They just shifted from commercial to residential. So you know, developing that strategic plan and outlining, you know, the next couple of years on what we were going to do in, in various line items and, or li I'm sorry, lines of effort throughout our, our kind of operational processes that, that guide the day-to-day, -day. having that plan and having it written down and having performance measures and dates and, and quantifiable metrics that we can measure ourselves against. We did that right out of the gate when it was just two of us. So where, really where that helps is when you start to grow and now we're at, we have six core folks um, hiring two other people and we have, you know, some folks that work at our facilities. So they, they see the strategic plan and they have access to some of the other trackers that we have. And that kind of gets them, everybody rowing their, their boat in the same direction. So that's pretty high level. So it's, sometimes it's hard for, for frontline folks to, to translate what they do on a day-to-day -day basis to the overall strategy for the company. And that's really where operational planning comes in. It's kind of the next level down that we do that, that decomposes those strategic level objectives that are based on kind of a three-year cycle down into annual operating uh, guidance, which is then broken down into tasks at the tactical level, which then anybody can understand. So it's that full decomposition from the very high level down to the frontline person that, that enables complete alignment with your mission, vision, and values and what you're trying to achieve. And I think that's really what has, has spurred our growth the most because there's no, there's no shiny ob object syndrome. Nobody comes into work every day or a, like any day not knowing what they should be working on. Um, everybody knows where, you know, what, what does that shining light look like at the end of the tunnel? It's very clearly defined for us. And I think that's really what's helped spur our growth over the last couple of years. Yeah, and no, a lot of good points there. I mean, be, being focused on what your true objectives are and, and then really breaking that down, as you said, and, not, and, and then that helps you avoid. Once you start really focusing on, okay, what's my true objective? Now breaking that down, what does that look like? What are the strategies that we can do and, and how do we implement that? That helps you avoid that shiny object syndrome that so many, I think, real estate investors and really entrepreneurs in general, uh, you know, they get trapped in uh, and they lose focus. And then all of a sudden they don't know where they're going. Um, and so it's, it's just so easy to get caught up in. But if you truly have as you said, establish that endpoint and then broke it down from there uh, helps you uh, navigate through that. It does. And, and, you know, for folks that are just starting out, you know, it's really important to kind of figure out what you're good at and what you're not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we do that by everybody in our company takes a number of different personality tests uh, to, to kind of understand. And for those folks, that have read Ray Dalio's principles. We actually have baseball cards as well in, inside of our company that are, are not nearly as built out as Bridgewater's, but they are there so that, that everybody kind of understands what their teammates, kind of their personalities. But, you know, from the entrepreneur and founder, you know, as I, as I mentioned, with Ryan develops rapport amazingly. I don't so much. I'm kind of like a snapping turtle, right? <laughs> so that's my... My, my personality is not to go out and work a room where Ryan is brilliant at that. And I'm probably a little bit more system focused and, and disciplined on, on adhering to the plan than, than Ryan more on the visionary side. So if you go back to, to Wickman, um, I think it was Wickman on, uh, I don't know if it was in Traction or one of his other books, he talks about the, the, the two kind of key 
you know, the visionary and the implementer, I think are the two terms he used. I, I might be off on yeah. that, but I believe those are the two terms. And, and Ryan is kind of a visionary guy and I'm more of the implementer. So we kind of complement each other's skill set really well. And it's important to do that because if you, if you have to do too much of the stuff that you absolutely hate, uh, your business won't grow because you really won't want to do it. Yep. Yep. I think, I think you're right on the book. I think it's traction with Gino Wickman um, where he talks about that. Um, so what's, what's one of the biggest mistakes you or your company has made and how have you guys learned from it uh, and transitioned? Didn't fire fast enough. So, you know, uh, we could have probably avoided some, some big problems and I'm, I'm going to be, purposely vague here. Um, so we, we could have we could have avoided some big problems if we'd have fired a couple of folks uh, a lot earlier um, and just took the pain of, of firing those people kind of up front versus versus waiting um, and, and, and just sticking it out and it's now causing a lot of problems for us that we have to kind of fix, which we, we will fix, but it's eh, if we would have, instead of letting it keep going on and on and on and just dealing with, with, you know, nonsense and nonsense and nonsense, because we didn't want to take the pain and the delays that it would have caused it, we probably would be in a better situation right now. So that's something that we really kind of, we, we've learned from and it's, it's very much changed now. If something's not working out, we, we, we terminate that person pretty fast um, or that team member or that, that contractor or that, that, architect or lawyer or whatever it is, we, we get rid of them pretty fast versus limping along with somebody that doesn't necessarily fit our team. Yeah. I mean, and great points. And for those who maybe are new or maybe they're making that mistake, it's, it's easy to, to not fire somebody because, well, first of all, you're messing with their livelihood. So if you've got a, if you've got a heart, you're, you're not excited to fire somebody. Um, but second of all, you think, okay, yeah, this is maybe bad, but hopefully they can right the ship or, uh, what, what am I going to do anyway? If I, when I fire them, I'm going to be, you know, now we got to hire somebody else and we don't have that person. And so you just continue to push them along. And in, in reality, in my experience, that's never been the right answer. It's always just get rid of the person, move on as quickly as possible. And grant that even if the project, if it's a contractor or whatever, and the project has to stall for, you know, two weeks, three weeks while you find the right person, that's worth it to get rid of the wrong person and to, to stall the project out still worth it i agree with you wholeheartedly yeah um <laughs> that's i've made those same mistakes so you know you always pay for it <laughs> in the end mm -hmm. um a couple more questions uh before we wrap up here um what someone someone that's trying to get to that next level, you know, wants to get to your level or, or beyond. What are some things that you would say take to get there? So I, I think having, you know, uh, you know, tying back into the strategic plan, having, having kind of a clear idea of what that next step looks like and then backwards planning what you need to do to get there it's hard for me to be detailed here because everybody's next yeah. step looks differently. I, I will say that you know, one of the things that I think that we did that is a little bit counter to some of the advice that I see posted in various places or talked about on podcasts is Ryan and I didn't go out and, and, and hire cheap labor first. I, I, I hear a lot of folks say that you know, I, I, the admin was my first hire and that was the, the best thing in my life. Um, I don't, I don't know that I fully agree with that. We went a different direction. We were, we were willing to give up equity in Spartan to hire really high level folks first. Hmm. So, you know, I have a saying, you can eat the whole grape or you can take a bite of the watermelon. I choose the watermelon every time. So, it, and, and we gave up a significant part of our company to get 
five or three other folks on, but they're really, really high powered folks. I, I could hire 42 assistants and they would not do even a fraction of the work that these three folks do. So bringing on those really high powered and very high paid folks by incentivizing them with equity and, and a smaller base salary because they, they believe in the vision and, and having that strategic plan written so that they can see the vision of your company so you can even convince these people that you're a good idea it was really, really kind of important in our growth because we had the brain power and the experience to really kind of take us to the next level. Yeah, that that's an interesting uh that's an interesting strategy and you're right i mean everybody talks about hiring that first assistant and that's truly what i did uh same thing and it was it was a great thing to do uh but you you kind of did it the the opposite ways as you hired somebody very high power than or whatever you want to call it but but uh to really help expand your business and did that first step so interesting uh interesting way and i can definitely see how that would work and folks might say well well who does all the like minutia minutia well we, we do have an office manager now but you know of the minutia if if i can delegate you know my super high power task to somebody that has more experience in business intelligence she knows how to research she knows how to use data well, you know, then scheduling my airline flights, really not that big of a deal because I've got somebody that's better at what I could do it anyways. And, you know, I've always found, I, you know, maybe I'm a control freak. Everyone on my team would agree with you, would agree with me on that one. But I've, I've never, I've never had a really good luck with assistance booking like my travel because I'm, I'm really finicky about it and I don't like the way they do it. So I end up like being irritated at them and eventually firing them. So I, you know, it's, it's never been in, and my and Ryan is the same way. So we re, we really never we never saw the the value in that. And you know, quite frankly, if you if you as long as your as long as the admin tasks of taxes and um, you know kind of legal stuff is taken care of by third parties, that most of the other admin tasks really don't matter. So if you don't do them, it's not catastrophic. Um, and, and I wouldn't delegate insurance to an assistant anyways. So that's something that we keep in house. And even on the, the tax and legal stuff, we keep that in like that to, to the chief officers because it's, it's kind of a existential threat if you get it wrong. The rest of the admin stuff just doesn't matter. So that's really kind of, that was our focus. Yep, that makes sense. Um, all right, so what's your favorite book uh let's go with a favorite book you've read within the last you know year or so so i think i've uh, you know one of the one of the ones that i i there's there's i'm gonna say two so uh one is principles by ray dalio mm -hmm. that is if you're starting to build your company and you've got at least a framework if, if you don't have a framework of your company yet it, it, it may not be that helpful of a book um but the other one is Originals, and I cannot think of the author's name for the life of me, but the name of the book is Originals. Is that, that sounds like, like a, a sci-fi, a sci like a superhero movie. Is that, is that what it is? Or is it, it, it a it, business it, book? It, it, it's a business book. Let me, <laughs> and it's, it's a business book that talks about um, kind of entrepreneurs, or entrepreneurs and kind of, original ideas and kind of where they come from um oh cool and it's really really good book yeah uh, i am trying to it is by adam grant by adam grant cool it has a snazzy multicolored o on the cover and it, that that was a really really good book cool well we always put those in the show notes so people can find them um, last question before we wrap up, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? So I, I think, um, you know, when, and, and I'll take it from a, a business side of the house, um, cause I'm, I'm generating wealth through, you know, my, my business is where most of my wealth is tied up. And I will say that, you know, really kind of 
the, the, there's when you when you do a SWOT analysis and you, you start looking at your company, a, a lot of folks get really wrapped around the axle about threats. Well, the best companies out there really put their resources towards seizing opportunities because you can usually generate a lot more by seizing opportunities than you can threats. I would say, you know, really kind of watch your expenses. Um, there, it's that slow death by a thousand paper cuts, and, and you can be amazed at, you know, how much a Starbucks coffee every day takes, you know, takes gas out of your engine. I will say. In the in the other pillar, that I will say that is that is probably the most essential one out of any of it, is build your team. And then, you know, the, the quote from Steve Jobs, hire smart people, don't tell them what to do, have them tell you what to do. And that's really kind of the, the I think, the three things that if you, if you focus on, that will really kind of make sure that if, if those three pillars are holding up a stool, and on that stool is a cup of, of liquid gold, if those three are in balance, then that stool will not tip and your cup of gold will not spill out. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, good, good stuff there for sure. Uh, well, very last uh, thing I got is how can our listeners get in touch with you? Yeah, they can, they can find us at www.spartan-investors.com or me personally at scott at spartan-investors.com. Awesome, Scott. Well, hey, I appreciate you joining us on the show. Uh, tons of great uh, value that you added. So definitely appreciate the time you were able to spend with us. Thank you, Todd. I appreciate being a guest on the show. And, and, I, and I hope my content really helps out your listeners. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you're, you're out of town right now at a site. So uh, good luck with everything there. Thank you. Headed back there right now. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thanks, Todd. Hey, shout out to Scott Lewis for joining us on the show. Appreciate him spending the time with us. And it's always fun to talk with uh, guys who are doing a little bit of different real estate than I am. I do a lot of multifamily and most of the people I talk to are, are doing multifamily as well. So it's nice to talk to somebody doing some self-storage, RV parks, doing some development. Uh, real exciting. So three things I took from this show, first of all, uh, Scott talks about knowing your numbers and making sure you understand, you know, what those are, where, where they are right now, where they're going and, and, uh, you know, all those trends. And so understand your numbers. Uh, next thing he talks about is building your team. Extremely important, uh, building a good solid team. And that can be employees that can be, uh, business partners, and that can just be others uh, who are helping you along the way who are going to be part of your success. So making sure you build a, a really strong team. And the last thing he talks about is understanding your end point, uh, where you're going to be taking the business and uh, your strengths and weaknesses and, and how to you know, grow your business to where you want to go eventually. So uh, great things that uh, Scott talked to us about. Reach out to him. That'll be on the show notes and, uh, and, and say hi to Scott. So again, appreciate it. You take care. Thanks for joining me. Take one thing from this uh, podcast that you got from Scott and, and really just apply it to your business and see how it can change. I'm Todd Dexter. I'm signing out. Make every day a Saturday. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. A couple things before we go. Again, go on to our Facebook page, Pillars of Wealth. We'd love to have you on there. Go on to iTunes, give us a rating and review, and subscribe to the show. Also, um, you know, don't forget, reach out to me if you want any help with uh, potentially growing your business, and reach out to John Styles to help you buy or sell real estate. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. Have a fantastic the rest of the day. And as I say, make every day a Saturday.